Uh, the total mass of a protoplanetary disk is typically a few percent, the mass of the central star. We're talking about the total mass, which means the mass in the gas and the mass in the dust. But at this stage, most of the gas is actually in the gas and not so much in the dust. Those protoplanetary disks are uh, rather short Leave structures in the sense that their typical lifetime is uh, typically up to uh, a few a few million years, and a interesting quantity that we can also estimate is the uh, stellar accretion rate, which is typically a few ten to the minus eight solar masses per year. Um, and here on the left hand side, I'm just showing a uh, sort of a cartoony of a disk, which shows the typical picture one would. Be Nagli have in mind when talking about protoplanetary disk, which is sort of a sort of continuous smooth structure of gas and dust around the central star, with a bit of gas and dust everywhere with perhaps dust of different sizes, populating different layers around the mid-plane with perhaps larger dust particles settling towards the mid-plane and smaller dust particles that could keep up in the air, if I may say, to uh, uh, layers quite away from, from the mid plane. So that's sort of typical, the typical view one has in mind with a, a protoplanetary disk. Um, an interesting implication of what I've just said for the lifetime and the accretion rate onto the star is that uh, there has to be a way for, for the gas to be either transported through the disk or removed from this. So people have tried and, and examined different ways of transporting mass angular momentum uh, in this, for instance, through turbulence, or perhaps have a different view of vertical extraction of uh, angular momentum by uh, the launching of magnetized disk winds at the surface of this. So there's a body of theoretical works that try to, uh, to, um, to determine what is the, uh, the, the way or the ways that uh, this gas evolve uh, in these young protoplanetary disks. Uh, something else that will be actually quite important for this presentation is to uh, is what actually we, we see in protoplanetary disks. What is the light that we see from protoplanetary disks? And so there's two many two flavors that this will emit light. I mean, the first is via dust, and the other is via the gas. And when you think about the dust particles, the sort of naive picture I'd like to have in mind is this one where you have some sort of a spherical dust particle, which can be thought of as being a collection of small, um, you know, discrete charged particles all over the dust particles. And whenever you have an incident electromagnetic wave that arrives near the dust particle, then, you know, that wave just um, excites. Uh, sort of small dipole moments uh, by its electric fields and the emission that arises from those accelerated charged particles from those dipole moments is what we call scattered light. So that's light scattered off the dust grains. That's one flavor of the disk emission. And this is something that we tend to rather see when we observe disk at near infrared wavelengths. Um, but that's not the end of the story because part of the um, incident um, electromagnetic energy is also used to heat up these uh, uh, accelerated charged particles and part of the uh, incident energy is also transformed into internal heating and that internal heating is released at some sort of a uh, continuum uh, at all wavelengths and this is what uh, is called the continuum emission and this is basically thermal re-emission of the starlight by the dust particles. This is something that you know we observe at all wavelengths from the near infrared to, to the radio wavelengths. And this is something that we be mostly sensitive to when we observe this at radio wavelengths, which would be sort of the core of this presentation, so to speak. There's also gas, as just said before, we will not touch too much upon gas today, but we can discuss that after if you would like. Um, so the idea here is that um, Spatially resolved observation of protoplanetary disk have shown that this, that naive picture I've shown just before of this being sort of a continuous smooth structure is not really quite what we see. And what we see is that these seem to have uh, lots of structures. And when we observe the disk continuum emission at radio wavelengths, so that is probing the disk at radio submillimeter wavelengths, we see a bunch of structures that you see 
uh, zoo of on the left hand side, which is taken from a project called the disk at uh, high uh, the this had high angular resolution project where you see a bunch of this observed with ALMA at 1.3 millimeter, which you see all sort of structures. You tend to see uh, dark uh, rings of emission, sometimes bright rings of emission. You can sort of see also not axisymmetric structures, which can be arc shaped emission, this kind of crescent shaped emissions like here or like here. You should see my pointer move by the way, so if you don't see it well. Hopefully you see it move. Uh, sometimes those uh, structures can take, uh, that can look like large scale spiral. So anyway, I mean, we have rings, we have those large scale asymmetry, which seem to be quite common features in the discontinuum emission. And um, the point here is that those dark and bright structures are often thought of as being uh, due to under densities and over densities in the dust. That uh, dark rings would be dust under densities, bright rings would be dust over densities. And one has to bear in mind that this is generally not quite straightforward because the intensity of the continuum emission is not only depend, dependent on the dust of a density, but it's also dependent on the dust temperature and the dust opacities, which then self depend on the dust size distribution, the dust composition, porosity, among other things. But usually the shortcut that people do and which we will make also in this presentation is to relate intensity of continuum emission with the density of the dust. And when we think about it, well, I think we can say that the transitions we see uh, between uh, dark and bright structures in the intensity of continuum emission should point to the necessary presence of dust traps, which would prevent dust particles from drifting radially towards the central star on account of the different velocities that the gas and the dust have when orbiting around a central star. And these kind of dust traps uh, require some specific conditions to form and this is something that can happen whenever we have local maxima in uh, the gas pressure in the protoplanetary disk and so many uh, theoretical works have looked at different ways of generating pressure maxima in this gas. So that can be planets and in particular giant planets. And this is something I will show uh, a lot in this presentation. Uh, but there are other ways, other planet-free mechanisms, if I may say, to generating uh, pressure maxima in a gas, which can be magnetohydrodynamical instabilities, perhaps photo evaporation from the central star, uh, maybe I mean, among other possible mechanisms. And I guess one reason why planets have been quite popular in this area, it's because the structures we observe in the discontinuum emission are, as a matter of fact, quite, quite reminiscent actually of the structures we see in hydrodynamical simulation of these planets interactions. And that's, uh, I'm showing you here actually an example of one such simulation where you see the gas surface density of a protoplanetary disk uh, that is uh, perturbed by an embedded uh, Jupiter mass planet, which is where the white circle is. And you can see that the planet triggers spiral density waves, which is reminiscent of the spirals we've seen on some of the images before. Sometimes the planet, when it's massive enough, can uh, sort of kick the gas away from its orbit and carve an arm little gap around its orbit, which sort of reminiscent to the dark rings of emission we've seen before in the observation. And sometimes you see that at the other edge of the planet gap, the large scale vortex can form. And this is the result of an hydrodynamical instability, which is known as the Rossby wave instability, which is sort of the uh, equivalent for the barotropic instability in geophysical field dynamics for those of you maybe familiar with this, uh, with this view. So uh, you see that, uh, if we assume that the structures we see in the discontinuum emission have to do with planets, which is again, not straightforward, but let's assume that may be, then I guess there's lots of uh, interesting questions when they arise, that may arise from this. And, and in particular, if really there are planets that are hidden and embedded in their disk, then the first question I would like to 
raise is what this is all telling us about the efficiency of planet formation and, and, and planet orbital evolution. That's one question. And the other question, which is uh, perhaps a little cheeky is that, well, except the two planets in the cavity of the PDS 70 disk, which you see here uh, on the left-hand side as viewed by sphere at near infrared wavelengths, there has been no direct detection today of planets within protoplanetary disk. So somehow, where are these planets at all? So that's, I think, a relevant question. And this actually uh, brings me to the second part of my presentation, which is on uh, the disk around the MWC 758 star. So you see some uh, physical properties of the star uh, listed on top of the slide. We just remember that this is a young star, which is, uh, has a mass slightly above a solar mass. And perhaps an interesting uh, constraint you can discuss after is the, uh, the accretion rate on the star, which is actually quite substantial, about 10 to the minus eight solar masses per year. And we see why this is actually an interesting constraint. I guess that disk is perhaps an emblematic example of the fact that disks could look very different when observed at different wavelengths. And here I'm showing you my favorite image of the disk uh, with ALMA. So this is at 0.9 millimeter. Uh, this is work from Robin Dong a couple of years back. And you see that basically there's a lot of remarkable features in the disk. The first that you can see emission very close to the star here, that purple dot there. But you see that the star is surrounded by a wide cavity, which is about 40 astronomical units wide, that's more the scale of the solar system, planet, giant planet-wise, so that's quite huge. And just outside of that cavity, you have that inner ring of emission, which happens to be non-axis symmetric uh, with the southwestern part, which is brighter than the other parts, and this is uh, here, what is denoted by clump two, which is the brightest part of that inner ring. And interestingly, you also see, although this is a sky uh, plane view, but believe me that this inner ring happens to be moderately eccentric with an eccentricity of about point 0.1. So that's actually quite cool. And there's also a crescent shape arc of emission to the uh, northwestern part of the disk, which is denoted by clump one in that image. Um, and also there's some background emission, which seems to have a complex structure with some parts that are brighter than others. So you see that there's a lot of complexity in this disk. And um, of course, now we can have a look at the disk uh, at different wavelengths and in different uh, species. And, and an interesting constraint on that disk is what we get when we observe uh, the gas. So now when we observe gas transition, I mean, the emission from specific lines of emission, uh, there's different sort of uh, gas species one can trace. H2 is super hard to observe in protoplanetary disks. So usually one would resort to the next most abundant species we can observe molecular wise in disk, which is CO, carbon monoxide. There's all sorts of different flavors, different isotopologues of CO, 12 CO, 13 CO, C8, you know, and, and other friends. And usually when we try to get to the rarest isotopologues, because since they are more rare, they, which means that the chemical abundance is smaller, they tend to trace the emission from the gas closer to the midplane. And so Hugh is one of those rare isotopologues where one would believe that what we see, what we observe has to do with what happens to the gas close to the midplane. And this is quite interesting to see that there seems to be sort of a cavity in C18 as well. And I got extremely interesting to see and to, to, to know whether this is telling us that there is indeed a lack of gas, like we would have an actual lack of H2 gas within uh, the central parts of the disk, or perhaps the fact we do not see any ops in the emission in C18 could have to do with some chemical peculiarities of C18, like photo dissociation and stuff like that. But let's not get too much into that. There's a cavity in the gas. And the funny thing about it is that we still have a substantial accretion rate of gas onto the star. So if there's no gas around the star, 
where does the gas come from to come from a significant accretion rate onto the star? So that's one of the uh, things that make this apparent cavity in the gas theory of fun. But again, I mean, you see that outside of the cavity, there's a ring of emission in the gas, which happens not to uh, be sort of consistent with, with what we get with the continuum emission. There's a maximum of emission to the uh, southeastern part of the disk, which does not correspond to something obvious when looking at the image on the left hand side. Again, perhaps that's why we're here, we're not quite sure about that. Anyways, we can have a look at the disk at other wavelengths in the uh, continuum emission. This is now showing to the same scale. The disk now observed with a VLA at nine millimeter. This is taken from a paper with Simon Casasus last year. And there's two uh, main things that you can see when comparing the two images on the left and the right. The first is that when looking at the emission of uh, that club one to the north uh, west part of the disk, you see that the emission looks much more compact at nine millimeter than at 0.9 millimeter. And to some extent, this is the sort of uh, prediction we expect out of what is called azimuthal trapping of dust, meaning that there has to be a structure that supposedly leads to a trapping of the dust that leads to a trapping that is more efficient as larger particles are concerned. And since emission at radio wavelengths is sensitive to the size of the particles that emit, the longer the wavelengths, the larger the dust particles what is sensitive to, then this is the sort of, you know, uh, what we expect out of the fact that larger dust particles should be collected should be more compact, has a larger concentration and therefore a more compact emission at where you wait lens. So we interpreted this as an actual dust azimuthal trapping going on. But now if you look at clump two, which is again the brightest part of the inner non-axis symmetry ring, you see that basically clump two is barely detected, if, if detected at all, actually at, at nine millimeter, which was sort of non-expected since CLAM2 was by far the practice part of uh, the emission at 0.9 millimeter. And so we interpreted this as now the opposite as the statement just before, since we do not see a lot of emission, the emission is much more elusive at longer wavelengths, then this is presumably due to the fact there's a default or lack of dust azimuthal trapping going on. And uh, how we thought about it was that there was perhaps some sort of vortical structure, some sort of vortex in the gas that somehow decayed and let the dust just get out of a vortex and, and expand that diffusive emission. But I will just get into more details about the dynamics of dust and gas just in, in a few slides. We are just getting into the observations again. The disk has been observed with fear at new infrared uh, wavelength. So this is now more sensitive to the scattered light. So again, the light scattered off the small dust grains populating the upper layers of protoplanetary. This is what usually what we think we observe at near infrared scattered light. So now you see that the emission is completely different. We do not see rings. We do not quite see a cavity. But what we see is uh, the complex structures, but with two prominent spirals, this one and this one. So the fact that there's uh, spirals uh, at the infrared uh, wavelengths, the fact we have uh, different rings, non-axis symmetric emission, the fact that the disk gas and the disk dust looks eccentric in the radio images led us to propose that perhaps there were planetary companions that would just you know, primarily sculpt the disk. So that's basically the, uh, the model we did and this is uh, work that we did uh, last year. And so I'm not going to more the, uh, the detail of what we've been doing. So again, I mean, I'm, today for this presentation, I end up presenting a single project, but quite and do it in full. Hopefully that works. So now that we've seen the observational context of the work, so now the modeling parts, so what we did was to do two dimensional hydrodynamical simulations that model the gas and the dust of a protoplanetary disk with two giant planets uh, in, the, in the disk. And then we uh, process the results of these hydrodynamical simulations with three dimensional dust radiative transfer calculations to produce synthetic maps that we can then compare with observations. 
So regarding the uh, the this model that we use, so we uh, do hydrodynamical simulations. Basically, we use the Navier-Stokes. We solve the Navier-Stokes equations for the gas on a two-dimensional photo grid, and we use the uh, the code Fargo for that. Uh, we need to do a bunch of assumptions on what the disk structure looks like. So we need to specify the disk temperature, the disk density, among other things. So you can see what kind of temperature structure that we used uh, with that particular temperature that was constrained from a previous study based on observations and qualitative transfer calculations from these authors. And basically, for those of you maybe familiar with this planet interaction stuff, then the one of the relevant quantities when one wants to think of with this planet interactions is what we call the disk spec ratio, which is the uh, vertical to radial scale height ratio, and which is about 0.09 uh, at, uh, in this study, actually uniformly. Uh, the other quite relevant quantity in this, uh, in this disk modeling is um, how we model the turbulent transport of mass or angular momentum and and usually this is something that we model with a, an equivalent climatic viscosity, what we call a turbulent viscosity. And usually we model it with a dimensionless number, which is called uh, the alpha turbulent viscosity, and the level of which would just you know, translate to the efficiency of the turbulent transport of mass on the momentum. And here we use an alpha of 10 to the minus four, which we believe is representative of the typical level of turbulence we expect from the other parts of protoplanetary disk, typically at a few tens of AU where actually our modeling is taking place. Um, so we have two giant planets, as I said before. So we have two uh, giant planets that will open annual gaps around the orbits. Basically in our model, we have those two giant planets. So we have here uh, the perturbation of the gas surface density, which is shown in cylindrical polar coordinates. So this is the azimuth in y axis. This is the radial cylindrical coordinate in x axis. Just to show you the planet's location, here you can see the planet's mass, the planet's location, and perhaps you can recognize the fact that the planets would launch spiral density waves, and the planets would also carve annular gaps that look like these uh, rectangles in polar cylindrical coordinates. So here, this is for the outer planet. Here, this is for the inner planet. And basically, what we see is that the outer planet is quite quite a massive planet. Five Jupiter mass planet is able to launch several spiral density waves in the inner disk in the, in that propagate inward of that planet. And so this is, we believe, a necessary condition to account for the two large scale spirals we observe in the disk in sphere with uh, the near infrared scattered light. And also that, that outer planet is actually sufficiently massive so that at the inner edge of its gap, a vortex can form uh, due to the Rossby wave instability that I alluded to just before. And this is something that is perhaps better seen in this image uh, now on the bottom right corner of the slide where we see now the relative perturbation with respect to the initial state of what is called the potential vorticity of the gas, which is that funny hydrodynamical quantity that these planet interactions are very much friend of, and which is the vertical component of the velocity curve divided by the gas surface density sigma. And that's a relevant quantity that is useful to trace the presence of vortices. And basically, whenever you have a blue here, that denotes that spot flow location of the vortex. So here we have a large scale vortex, which is quite elongated. And you see that there's another vortex there at the other edge of the gap opened by the inner planet, at least initially, as we can see in, the, in a few moments. So you see that there's another vortex there. So, you know, just at first place, you can perhaps figure out that this large scale vortex could be uh, one way to model the uh, emission coming from Club One in the analog observation of the disk, and that uh, inner vortex could be perhaps a way to account for the emission of Club Two. So, this is what we're going to discuss. After, just to finish with the assumptions of the work, we discard planetary migration in this work. So the planets are fixed on, uh, have fixed secular orbits. And then we have also constraints from ALMA observation for the gas. So this is telling us that, you know, how to choose the, the surface density, the initial surface density of the gas in the simulations. And it turns out that this choice of the gas surface density 
uh, told us that the self gravity of the gas was something important to take into account in the algorithmical simulations, and that has to do mostly with the uh, how vortices would react to the presence of the gas self gravity, and uh, we can talk about that uh, after if you like. Uh, now regarding the dust, the way we model the dust is via Lagrangian particles and those Lagrangian particles will feel the gravity of the star, the gravity of the planets, of course, but they will also feel the gravity of the gas because the gas feels its own gravity, so the dust will also feel the gravitational potential of the gas and this is, I believe, something that is quite important because it means that the gas and the dust will feel exactly the same gravitational potential. And the consequence of that is that the only difference of acceleration felt by the gas and the dust is the acceleration arising from the pressure gradient that the gas feels and that the dust does not feel. So it means that there is a velocity difference between the gas and the dust due to the pressure gradient force that implies a gas-like force that the gas exerts onto the dust. And also because uh, there's a little bit of viscosity going on for the gas, we have a way to sort of uh, impart that turbulent bit of motion by stochastic kicks to uh, Lagrangian particles. You can be more specific about that if you wish after the, after the talk. Uh, but we did some, I mean, quite simple things in the sense that there's no whatever interactions between the dust particle, there's no dust cell gravity, there's no dust collisions, no growth, no fragmentation, and even worse, we have no dust feedback onto the gas, which is very bad, I know about that, uh, but, you know, we, we explore the importance of dust feedback in a future work. Um, we also need to specify what we do for the uh, particle sizes that we adopt in the simulation. So we have a size distribution with dust particles typically between 10 micrometer and one centimeter because this is sort of the relevant range of particle sizes we want to model to, um, to be able to predict the synthetic emission in the sub millimeter range of wavelengths. So that's why we opted for this range of uh, particle sizes. Basically, we had all the particles located initially between the planets because that was very convenient to maximize the particle resolution where we mostly need. And we had that particular size distribution for the uh, for the for this uh, for the dust particle, which is not quite in line with the observation. But whenever we do not take this feedback into account, it turns out that the size distribution can be adopted uh, quite freely uh, because. All what matters for the dust relative transfer calculation is the spatial distribution of the dust, and not the actual mass, because the dust particles do not really convey a dynamical information to the disk gas since uh, they do not drag the gas, basically. The particles we adopted had this uh, perhaps lower than conventionally used internal density of 0.1 gram per centimeter cube, which is mostly inspired by. Uh, results from the Rosita survey of the 67 uh, Trujino Gerasimenko uh, <clears throat> comet with, you know, uh, the properties of the dust particles from the, uh, from the tail of the comet that is telling us that uh, for the size, for the size of, for the, for the range of particles cited that we're interested in, it's possible that actually dust particles are not as compact as conventionally thought. So that's why we tried that particular low value for the internal density. All right, so now uh, getting to the, the dynamics, so now you should have seen uh, the top right image move, and now what you see is again the, uh, in black and white, the perturbation of the gas uh, potential vorticity that we said just before, but now you see a bunch of points that uh, correspond to the location of the dust particles in the simulation with the color corresponding to the particle size, you can see here with this color bar, so from 10 to the minus size meters, 10 micrometer to a centimeter in size for the red dots. So basically what you see is that where you have the vortices, you have the dust being collected at the location of the vortices. So this is especially clear for the inner vortex there. And we can see that there is a, a good one-to-one -one correspondence between the vortex location and the location where the dust particles get trapped. But the thing is that here at that location, just the other, at the other edge of the planet, the inner planet's gap, you see that you have 
a huge concentration of large dust particles. And this is actually quite problematic because now if you post-process that simulation at that very time scale and you know, look at for the synthetic map of the dust continuum emission, what you would see at that location is just a blob very, very strong blob of emission, not only upon nine millimeter, but also a nine millimeter wavelength. And this is not what we see actually, uh, in particular at nine millimeter, where we do not quite recover what I call clump to uh, a few slides ago. But it turns out that this um, gas structure evolves in time, and in particular, on account of the fact that the disk gas becomes moderately eccentric over time. And I believe that this is a consequence of the interaction between the disk gas and those two plan massive planets that we have. And if you look at the contours of this ISO uh, potential vorticity perturbation, I think it's, it's, it's fair to, to, easy, to say that one can easily say that the disk gas becomes moderately eccentric with an eccentricity, which is about 0.1, which is what is suggested by the observations. And one implication of the disk gas becoming eccentric is the fact that the vortex that forms at the outer edge of the inner planet's gap, it gets uh, stretched and it decays ultimately. And the implication of the vortex decay is that the dust that were initially collected within the vortex just lose the azimuthal trapping of the vortex since the vortex disappears and the dust particles just get unconfined from the vortex. I'm sorry for that bad joke, but uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, it turns out that these um, the, the particles get away from the vortex at different speeds depending on their size. And it turns out that this is something that can uh, actually explain this elusive um, detection of the emission at long wavelengths as I'm going to show you in a few slides. Uh, well, so again, once that we've done those hydro simulations, we need to run the uh, relative transfer machinery. So I believe that this is an extremely busy slide that perhaps you do not want me to go into, but there you go, you have it and we can discuss it after if you would like. But just to say that we need to transform the two dimensional gas surface density into a three dimensional gas mass with density and we need to have it for the dust. And then we need to compute the temperature of the dust. And once we get that, we need to solve the radiative transfer equation in all its glory with a public code that is called radiancy 3 d which accounts for thermal absorption, scattering, and so on and so forth. And basically the result of that radiative transfer code is a flux map, a synthetic map of emission that we can compare observations with. So I'm not gonna get any more details, but if you want me to, if you would like me to, to have any question on that, we can go back after the presentation. So just getting into the results, so you can see now the right hand side, where it looks like a map of the intensity of the continuum emission from the simulation at port nine millimeter. This is a deep projected view of the, of the disk, if you would like with the uh, radial distance on y-axis and the position angle uh, in x-axis, which can be thought of as being just an azimuthal angle. And basically what we see is a compact uh, emission here, uh, which as you will see in Cartesian coordinates in a few styles resembles what we have for clump one. And here we have some sort of a uh, inner ring, which you can see is clearly non-axis symmetric, and you can see also the eccentricity of the inner ring. The reason why I'm showing uh, the result like this and not in the sky plane and compared with the observations straight away is to show you the comparison with the result of the hydrodynamic force simulation, again on the left-hand side with the gas surface density in black and white log scale and the location of the dust particles again, so that you can see the correspondence between the synthetic structures we predict and where it comes from in terms of the location of the dust particles. So basically, this corresponds to the dust particles 
located within the vortex carved by the, by the outermost uh, planet. And here you can see that the inner ring of continuum emission corresponds to that eccentric ring of large dust particles that forms on account of the decay of the vortex uh, that formed initially at the other edge of the inner planet gap. A few more details about the dust size distribution that we've adopted for the radiative transfer calculations can be found there. But just let me compare now with the actual observed map. This is the deprojected map of the observation because we have some good ideas of what the inclination of the disk related to the line of sight is. So we can sort of compare how the intensity of emission looks like in the disk plane and not in the sky plane. So this is exactly what is shown here. And you see that basically we can sort of qualitatively reproduce the main features of emission, the presence of current one is about the right level of emission in the synthetic and the observed map. You can compare the numbers here in Vigitchensky Pudin. We can sort of recover the inner eccentric ring with about the right shape and uh, the right eccentricity that we sort of recover. And perhaps this is now uh, even better viewed when looking at now the sky plane. So we project again onto the sky plane, observation on the left hand side, synthetic map on the right hand side. And basically, you can sort of see that, well, you know, the inner ring is there, the outer clamp is there. There's something that is not there in the synthetic maps is that we're missing a lot of the background emission that we seem to observe here in the observed map. And one way that we thought about it is that, you know, the fact that we assume a population for the dust particles, which has a bubble size distribution is perhaps something that is an academic choice and perhaps not necessarily physically motivated. And the fact that in the simulation, the disgust becomes eccentric. The fact that we have those spiral waves uh, excited by the planets, we are actually quite strong shock waves. Let us think that perhaps uh, if we had been able to model dust fragmentation and dust growth, perhaps we would have witnessed the uh, continuous production of small dust particles due to fragmentation, due to substantial velocity differences uh, because of the disk complex dynamics in between the two planets. So we uh, guess that perhaps there was a population of very small dust particles in addition to the one uh, we simulated uh, in the aerodynamical simulation. So we assume that perhaps there was a population of very small dust particles. Here you have the mass, which is well coupled to the gas and which once it is taken into account can lead to further emission uh, of uh, the background in between the two rings or between the inner ring and the outer arc. And you can see that we can sort of find a, a, a background uh, emission, which you can perhaps see that it looks like a spiral. And this is part of the spiral that the other planet actually generates. And this, you know, makes me think of that spiral that we also see in the, uh, in the observation. Looking at the, this now, nine millimeter, the observation again on the left hand side, this is the synthetic map on the right hand side. And the fact that the, uh, we have that inner vortex uh, that decayed and let the uh, large particles get out of the vortex uh, implies that the emission now at the inner uh, part of the disk is indeed smaller than what we would predict at the location of the outer arc. <clears throat> it's not, uh, vanishing uh, though, and um, <clears throat> but perhaps this is going the right direction and perhaps a significant difference or something that does not help the comparison between the observation and the synthetic map is the absence of noise in the synthetic map. But this is something that we try to model in a very crude way by uh, <clears throat> having some sort of white noise added to the synthetic map prior to being convolution with zero mean with some standard deviation for the noise that uh, is dictated by the 
observing noise, the RMS of the observation noise, basically. And basically, well, you can see that once the noise is added with the right properties, well, the emission, the synthetic, the predicted emission are clumped to still visible. It's not uh, buried within the noise, but still, you know, qualitatively speaking, I would claim that the comparison is, is, not, is not too bad. Uh, here I have some further details, but I will not go into that because I want to show you some further results before I'm getting kicked out of this webinar. Uh, the disk again seen in polarized intensity in the infrared observation on the left hand side, synthetic map with noise on the right hand side. And basically, we see, basically see uh, the spirals that the outermost planet, that five Jupiter mass planet at 140 AU generates in the disk and which leads to these spirals that sort of can recover the shape and the pitch angle, which is not something I had expected uh, prior to doing the calculations, I must confess. Um, there is substantial difference regarding the sort of dust population we have to take into account here for the infrared catalyte because we are dealing with very small dust particles that scatter light out of the upper layers of the disk, which we do not model in two-dimensional simulations. So we had to do some different set of assumptions in terms of the kind of dust particles we have, uh, more compact particles, silicates, well coupled to the gas, and so on. But basically, we can sort of have two spirals in the infrared as well, although we tend to have much more emission at the infrared than actually observed. And there are interesting questions related to this uh, comparison. I have a, uh, a light discussion here, just to say that, you know, this exercise is interesting in the sense that there are things that we can explain. So some things can sort of work pretty well, I guess, with our two giant planet scenario. There are things that, of course, we can improve in terms of the fact that we tend to observe the cavity in the gas, and this is not something that uh, that comes out of a model, and perhaps this means that we need additional physical mechanisms that were not modeled in our simulations to uh, explain the observations. Um, there are some further ways to, to improve. Of course, we could have done three-dimensional simulations. Dust feedback onto the gas is certainly something that is important to take into account. And regarding the modeling of the radiative transfer, something that I'm quite keen on doing is to try and see the predictions of the scattering when we go beyond the theory of modeling dust as compact spherical stuff. Um, just to, I think if, if you have not realized it yet, you have to realize that this sort of game, as we were discussing just before the webinar, this game of comparing uh, model predictions with observations is of course extremely degenerate because there are many free parameters. And it turns out that the main parameter that controls the dynamics of the dust within the gas is actually the ratio of several of those free parameters that include the size of the dust, the internal density of the dust, the surface density of the gas, and the alpha turbulent viscosity of the gas. It's unfortunate, but it's like this. Still, I believe that this kind of exercise can um, teach us things because I guess that's the whole aim of doing this kind of modeling is what we learn from that. So there are interesting questions having to do with the fact that we had to have, to have a vortex that decay. So there are interesting timing issues related to this particular point. And of course, the implications of planet formation and evolution are extremely relevant questions as we have already emphasized. There's some analogies with other disk, but if you just allow me for a few more minutes, if you don't mind, I would just want to, uh, to, to quickly advertise the work of my PhD student, I guess, uh, this is something I care about. And uh, what, what we sort of thought of was this 
sequence of multiple dark and bright rings in the disk continuum emission that has been observed in many protoplanetary disks. And perhaps many of you have already seen that picture before of the HL2 protoplanetary disk, which is presumably the emblematic example of a disk with several dark and bright rings of emission. And so people usually think about the presence of dark rings as being due to location where there is no dust or little dust or dust gaps, if you wish. And usually people think about those dust gaps as due to planets, just like planets have gas, gaps in their gas. They can, of course, as we've seen actually in the simulations in this presentation, they will open gaps in the dust as well. And so usually people would think that they could be just as many embedded planets in the disk as they are dark greens, which is basically sort of naive cartoon I've tried to, 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 to put it here. But so with my PhD student, Gellor Vafler Fernandez, we tried to, uh, to, to examine another route and look at the implications of planetary migration in the dynamics of dust particles and uh, their continuum emission. And uh, following uh, the steps of uh, the uh, this planet migration gang in Queen Mary with Colleen and Tatian and, and, and Richard, we uh, looked at the uh, large scale migration of a giant planet in a disk. And uh, it turns out that in young and massive disks, the migration of planets in a range of mass typically between Jupiter and Saturn can be discontinuous, can be intermittent in massive disks, as you can see perhaps on the image on the, in the image on the left hand side, which shows stages of relatively fast inward migration with stages of sort of relatively slower inward migration as well. And uh, this is actually a particular flavor, particular kind of behavior of the so-called TAT3 runaway migration, which is uh, relevant to planets in the range of masses said before in young and massive disks. And uh, so what we, uh, what, we looked like, what we looked at was the implications of this uh, changing the behavior of the migration pattern in the dynamics and emission of the disk. And what we, uh, what we found was that uh, the ability of the planet wakes, of the spiral wakes, to shock the gas, to generate the pressure maximum that can trap the dust particles is sensitive to the speed of migration of the planet relative to the gas. And basically for the planet wakes to efficiently shock the gas, you need the gas to be able to cross the wakes a number of times. You have to have repeated crossings through the wakes for the local gas to be locally shocked and for the local pressure maximum to rise. And this is something that works better, of course, when migration is slower. So the planet succeeds in forming a pressure maximum outside of its orbit initially that leads to that ring of dust particles that you can see on the right image. But then as the planet moves inwards, then that initial dust ring, that initial pressure maximum is sort of left away because the planet has just gone inward and cannot shock the gas efficiently along the way because the gas cannot cross the wakes repeatedly. But at some point when the runaway migration starts in and you have that stage of inward migration that's super fast, that is not something that can be sustained forever, as it turns out. And when the migration slows down at that particular location, the other wake of the planet can be strong enough again to shock the gas outside of the planet orbit, generate a new pressure maximum that can trap those particles, and then bang, you generate a second string there. And then the story starts again, inward migration, runaway migration, super fast, but not self-sustained another slowing down of the migration, again, the formation of a new dust ring. And you see there on the right hand side, the state of the simulation when the planet has got to the inner parts of the disk. And at the end of the day, you see that we form several dust rings just with a single uh, inward migrating planet, but you have to have intermittent migration or non 
continuous migration to get those several wings to form. And if you look at what uh, is going on in terms of the intensity of the continuum emission and perform those 3D dust relative transfer calculation, you can see that indeed with a single giant planet that migrates on a large scale in a discontinuous way, you can form uh, several uh, bright and dark rings of emission due to the several uh, steps in the migration pattern just shown before. And it seems that there's um, some interesting analogy, I would say, with this various observations where we do see these uh, sequences of dark and bright rings. So that was just a short advertisement for, for this work. We can talk about this uh, longer if you wish, just after we'd be delighted to do it so. But of course, there's many ways to again improve on this, uh, this modeling with three dimensional simulations with the predictions of this kind of work when looking at the radiative transfer in the gas. And I'll just close with a few concluding thoughts, not very much actually, just the first one is uh, simply that those observations of protoplanetary disk have clearly shown that perhaps disks were much more dynamical than we uh, used to think about it a few before we had all those special results observations. So if we have a bunch of structures again, I've talked about some of them like rings, like cats, uh, but there seems to be also a lot of funny things going on with perhaps inclination features like warps and perhaps some radial reinforce as well. So very dynamical behavior of this. And of course, uh, the uh, main question that drives that uh, presentation, which is what uh, this is all telling us about kind of formation and evolution still, still holds. Not claiming I have any answer to that question, but hopefully we at some point. I'll just stop here. Thank you. Need to work on some sort of format for clapping. <laughs> Cheers. I don't, I don't like the, de the deathly silence at the end. Well. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks very much, Clement. So, you're welcome. Ask if there are any questions either in the chat or raising your hand. So, Sasha first. Yeah. Uh, my question is about parameter alpha. Um, so you far. put it 10 to minus 4. Is it what kind of motivation uh, to take it like that and how results depend on this parameter and uh, observational effects as, uh, as well? Aha, that's one of the key questions here. Uh, the thing is that we have that observational constraint that the stellar accretion rate is large. 10 to the minus eight solar masses per year is a large accretion rate. And if you model the disk as what is done classically as a viscous accretion disk in a stationary state where the, um, where the mass accretion rate will be uniform through the disk, then in order to get a accretion rate of 10 to the minus eight solar masses per year, you would need an alpha, uh, turbulent parameter that is much larger than what I'm taking here. You would need like 10 to the minus two, basically. Um, and the thing is that, so, well, uh, many theoretical works, as you would know, have uh, tried and find ways to uh, get to alpha 10 to the minus two with, uh, in particular, magneto-hydrodynamical instabilities, whether the magneto-rotational instability can be the key to uh, the burning question of alpha being 10 to the minus two or something else. And it turns out that, well, I mean, for the MRI to work, you need a low magnetic field and you especially need the gas to be well coupled to um, the charged particles, but the ionization fraction in this is not as large as we would like it to be. And it turns out that a lot of non-ideal LHD effects, including, um, Omic resistivity, ambipolar diffusion, and others conspire to make the alpha locally in disks not as large as 10 to the minus two, at least in the outer parts of this. So it could be that we are in a situation where the inner parts of the disk can be sufficiently ionized to uh, drive the MRI and have a substantial efficiency of MHD turbulence with perhaps alpha 10 to the minus two. But it seems rather unlikely that we have 
that we can have a similarly efficient level of turbulent transport of angular momentum beyond, say, a few uh, tens of AU just to fix IDs and numbers. So that's why there have been a lot of uh, theoretical works that have tried to just, you know, set on that issue and uh, just uh, to examine how we can get transport of angular momentum at all. And so that's uh, where there's been this sort of shift in paradigm where perhaps uh, the outer parts of the disk, the angular momentum would not be transported radially in a turbulent fashion, but perhaps extracted vertically via magnetic winds if you have a vertical magnetic field that threads the disk. And it seems that according to MHD simulation that study this, it seems, it seems possible to have um, a sufficient extraction flux of angular momentum at the disk upper layers that drives sort of a laminar accretion flow through the disk with about the right um, M dot, the right uh, mass accretion rate. But I guess this is, yeah, this is, um, this is tricky. <laughs> yeah, and a uh, very short uh, last question. Uh, how many objects are, uh, look like um, proto-planet uh, disks? How many? Like 10, 20? So how many disks do we uh, actually... Yeah, how, many, uh, how many objects are absorbed which could be uh, treated as uh, protoplanet disks? Um, I will not be able to tell you how many protoplanetary disks we know in total, but my naive guess would be a few hundred. Now, what I can be a little more accurate on the number or on the statistics is the number of spatially resolved protoplanetary disks or circumstellar disks which I guess is, is currently somewhere between 50 and 100. Okay. But I guess there are many circumstellar disks that are just not resolved. The same, not yet. same order of magnitude as gravitational wave sources. Yes. <laughs> Joke. <laughs> <laughs> I see. Thank you. <laughs> Cheers. Uh, can I can I ask about so do, so in your middle picture on the left there, there's there's the study by Ruben Dong and and mm -hmm. others. So I think I remember. So they they also tried to explain these features, but did they only have an outer planet? I think. Yes. Um, so basically, um, the modeling work was associated to. Robin Dong co-authors in this disk was primarily aimed at explaining the spiral structures seen in sphere and infrared scattered light observations. And so what they did was just just very similarly to what, what we did was to, to assume an outer giant planet that is sufficiently massive to excite two spiral waves that propagate inward of that uh, giant planet. But the initial work uh, that they did put the outer planet perhaps not at a convenient location because that planet happened to be basically the location of the outer arc of emission in the, uh, in the ALBA observations, basically at the location of Trump 1. So I would tend to believe that this is not, um, this is not consistent. But basically this is, uh, this is the main idea. Um, there's perhaps an interesting alternative scenario, which perhaps could be an interesting way to follow the discussion is what if uh, there's no planets and what if we had a binary star? That could be quite interesting because if you have a binary star, you could explain the fact that there's perhaps a cavity in the gas, which is suggested by the CIT no gas observations, which suggests that there's not much CIT no emission in the central parts of the disk. And perhaps you could also trigger some of uh, the various structures that we see, including the spirals, including the uh, inner eccentric asymmetric ring. Not quite sure about clump one, the uh, other arc of emission. I'm not sure whether you can do it with 
just just the secondary substellar companion close to the primary one. But you know, I think that is uh, an interesting uh, way to think about those things as well. I mean, when you think about the uh, the statistics of binary stars in the solar neighborhood, I mean, some of these disks should be binary stars. It's just that we see one star and not several. And, and that's another question, actually. I mean, if just like planets, we think there are planets, we do not see planets. If we think there are stars, or if we think there's a secondary star, where are the secondary stars and why do not we see them? Uh, Richard. Uh, Clement, just a very quick question. Um, well, first of all, thank you for a very nice and clear talk. Uh, really enjoyed listening to it and uh, very nice work. Um, thank you. There are a number of these large disks that we see with uh, what I would describe as almost ubiquitous structure in them. Uh, at the same time, we know from the sphere and GPI surveys looking for giant planets, young giant planets at large radius from their stars that such objects tend to be or appear to be rather rare. Um, and I just wonder if you have any feeling or opinion on comparing the statistics for the structures that we see at large radius in protoplanetary disks and the relative absence of giant planets in surveys actually looking for young giant planets themselves and how we're going to reconcile this if we think that these structures do indeed arise because of the presence of giant planets? I wish I could answer this question. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a difficult one. It's, uh, it's indeed one of the uh, key questions. I mean, why do not we see the planets at all? Mm. Why do not we see them? Why do not we see any planets in sphere images? I mean, the only example we have is this PDS 70 disk where we see the planetary companions within the cavity. So what is this telling us? I mean, is this telling us that whenever planets are not within cavities, they are like surrounded by just too much dust, too mm. much gas, so that we cannot see them, they're just buried well inside the disk. At the same time, if they are really massive companions, they should carve gaps. So to some extent, you might expect to see the planets directly, except the planetary, so the circumplanetary environment is just too thick or too optically thick or that we cannot see anything. Yeah. And this is something that really is puzzling me. And, um, and I just don't know. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's also not just those objects which have got disks around them, but even those systems where the disks have disappeared, but the planets are young enough that we would expect them to be highly luminous, where we also don't see large numbers, do we? Um, I don't know exactly what the statistical limits are at the present time, but it's, I don't think, taking at face value, that we would be able to explain all of the structures in disks by relatively high mass planets because we don't see those planets present once the disks have disappeared. So it's, it's a big conundrum to me at least uh, as to how we reconcile these different aspects of the, of the observations. I do agree. Okay. Well, have you made, I mean, I was made any attempt because the gas observations, the C80 note, they showed an asymmetric gas distribution, right? Or is it a projection effect? So I've just literally started doing gas relative transfer calculations since uh, last week. So <laughs> I'm not advanced uh, enough to, um, uh, to answer your question yet. Um, so I can just quickly go back to um, to this uh, to this picture again. Um, I there are several things that uh, that puzzle me here. I mean, one is well, of course, we have that ring of emission that is uh, not axisymmetric, and this is interesting because the model that uh, we propose was. Uh, suggesting that there was a decayed vortex at the outer edge of 
the inner planets. So we will need to look at uh, whether this is consistent with the non-axisymmetric level of emission gas, but perhaps part of it could be also due to the presence of spirals. And uh, this is something that remains to be clarified. I mean, we do see spirals. Actually, you see this spiral in the ALMA image. It is especially coincident with one of the two spirals in the sphere uh, image. So we know that there is a spiral here uh, somehow. Now the spiral doesn't have the same vertical altitude as the dust in the mid plane. So mm. it's not perfectly clear whether this could explain part of the emission we tend to see there to the south eastern part of the disk. Um, and something that uh, I'm not too sure about too is, uh, you know, when we do the gas relative transfer calculation, so basically we start off from the gas surface density from the hydro simulation, then we do all the three dimensional expansion. And well, anyway, you have your 3D gas structure, which is meant to be H2, but then somehow you need to make an assumption on how this is going to look like in whatever flavor of CO you would like to model. And at some point, you may not be able to do satisfactory modeling just by assuming a constant abundance ratio between CO and H2. You need to start worrying about whatever makes uh, chemistry uh, an exciting job here with, you know, all what can photo dissociate, whether gas can freeze out on top of the dust particles, whether this is any relevant here. So there's, there, there, there could be chemical effects that also, uh, that also matter here. And I'm not sure yet what to think about it. And just, just to note that in the first instance, you can account for things like photo dissociation and freeze out just with very simple, you know, temperature and density dependent. That's exactly what I've done. Okay. This is exactly what I've done. I mean, I've assumed just freeze out below temperature of 19K and uh, a, uh, you know, just a, a very simple constraint on the vertical column density uh, for H2 uh, to uh, limit the effects of photo dissociation. I haven't had time to apply to that disk yet, to another one. So I'm really <laughs> sorry, I cannot answer today. Uh, but yes, that's, yeah. That's definitely something I, I want to check. I can tell that in the other disk I'm interested in, with, which is the ABR Riga disk, uh, photo dissociation does not seem to play a major role in this, you know, similar sort of modeling we're doing with, you know, this bad interaction stuff. So it remains to be seen. All right, if there's no further questions, then let's end the formal bit here. Thanks again, uh, Clément. Pleasure. And uh, thank you. Thanks for listening. So next week, there will definitely not be a an online seminar because many of us will be having fun in the uh, exam board meeting. Mm -hmm. No more seminar scheduled, but I'm always open to, to have one if we have interesting uh, suggestions for speakers but uh, otherwise thanks everyone for coming thanks for all thank you very much thank you thank you Clement. Thank you. Thank you. Good to see you then. up to see you guys soon in Hope life you. <laughs> <laughs> hopefully we can do this face to face sometime in the future. i would definitely love so right okay great to see you take care cheers Ciao. Richard, Richard, yes. I saw you on Wonstead, High Street Wonstead. Could be? Probably me, yes. Yeah, I just drive. <laughs> Next time, say hello.